yeah, so thanks for taking the time to come on the show today as well. I know you're super busy moving back and forth oh. as well. Oh, no, it's an honor. Thank you. When, when you're splitting time between those two things, do you have to fly from Hawaii a bunch on business or do you try to set it up so that you're in the U.S. when you have to do all the U.S. stuff and then when you're in Hawaii, you can actually have a life? You know, you, you would think that um, after 22 years of doing it that I would, but the reality is because, you know, you know this as being a self-employed freelance person that things arise. So what we do is we just base out of each place and then travel accordingly. I mean, there've been times where, and again, you know, it's all how you look at it. So I always go, well, this is an opportunity. Um, but I've gone to New York from Hawaii sort of three times in five weeks because they were spontaneous, great (sighs) jobs that you go. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's the nature of the beast. And, and I always kind of looked at it like, well, you set it up this way. And this is part of why you're not doing a nine to five job. And so this is the other side of that. Just and it's a great thing. Yeah, I suppose it's it comes with the territory. It's it's a bummer to fly from Hawaii to New York, which what is that like fourteen hours or something? It just seems so far. Yeah, well, going when you have the tailwind from Hawaii to New York, it's it's probably only about ten, ten or eleven, and then coming back, it's a little bit longer. But again, I just sort of look at the opposite, which is. Um, for me personally, I like being self-employed and being an independent contractor and you just have to be willing to do what it takes to do that. Yeah. And it sure beats going to an office and sitting in air conditioning and, and all that stuff for the, for every day. That would probably, that seems like the opposite of what you would be able to do. I mean, looking, knowing what, what I do about you and stuff like that, knowing how active you guys are sitting all day in a, at a desk would literally kill you, I think. Yeah, I think it would be, you know, there's people who sort of say, hey, listen, I love to have it. I love the window of, okay, I work from this hour to this hour. I leave it at the office. I go home and then that's it. I mean, you know this from the job that you do. The job is sort of all the time because it's also part of who you are. But I I like the movement and the freedom and the a little bit of the unpredictability of of what we do, certainly more than that sort of locked and loaded um, Monday through Friday deal. What is it with, about unpredictability that you actually like? Because I've I've heard that a lot from people in similar active kind of gigs, pro athletes and things like that. They love the routine of training in some way, but there's yes. also this element of excitement that comes from, oh, we're going to do this city and we're going to do that. And they don't seem to outgrow it. I mean, you're you're a mom now, you're married now, you still like that. Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it's a good point of I need a certain amount of linear activity, consistency in my training and my food to kind of keep me tethered to something. But then beyond that, you sort of feel like it's maybe what you liked about competition and training is it's a little bit unknown. And so to put yourself in an unknown situation on a regular basis feels good because you feel like you're sort of testing yourself. You're having an opportunity to rise to an occasion um, maybe it's a little bit, uh, uncomfortable or scary. So that, that feels good because it, I, I think, I feel like that's how you continue to get to know who you are. Um, and so I, I like it and it's, it's an adventure and, and, and quite frankly, you don't want things to always be the same because then you never grow. You're not learning new stuff. You're not challenging yourself in a new way. And, and I think that that sort of is an, an essence of life. It's uh, something I read in your book was life is lived outside your comfort zone. And that's a very popular, I hate the word meme because it sounds degrading, but I guess it is kind of a meme or, or <laughs> motto okay. of people, in, especially in your position, just constant improvement, constantly trying to make yourself uncomfortable uh, and, and grow. And uh, I think that's admirable. And I think that's what separates a lot of people who are successful in areas like you are versus people who just kind of are dreamers or wannabes. And I also read that you only feel like working out or training 50% of the time, which is really, I was surprised by that being <laughs> a pro athlete and you know, right. you're a model or you still are will only feel like training half the time. That sounds like me. Well, listen, I think, to, let's be honest. I think that's most people every once in a while I've met athletes or people. Now let's be clear about something. First of all, I believe in all of us, most of us we're athletes, right? There's some who kind of express it more and others, but every once in a while you meet a person and they can be an attorney, but they're an athlete and they are, you know, they wake up and they're driven and it's a, you know, they sort of, that's what they are doing. But I, I believe that most of us probably feel like training if you're lucky 50% of the time. So I, I always don't want to sell a bill of goods to people like, 
oh, I'm just so inspired every day and, y- you know, to go and and do it and be tormented. I'd rather be sitting down or I'd rather lay in bed for an extra, you know, 30 minutes or whatever that is. And so, because I think that's the important part of the message is it's just about creating that system and that infrastructure for success. It's not about feeling like you want to all the time. That's important to realize, I think, for a lot of people who are not even just with working out or athletics. I think a lot of people think, well, this isn't the job or career for me because I'm right. not 100 percent of the time. I'm not waking up motivated to attack the day or, oh, this isn't the sport for me or this workout's not going to work for me because I often don't feel like going. And when we read articles in Maxim or Self magazine or whichever <laughs> side of the glosses you fall yeah. on, the articles that have a lot of times people that that have careers similar to yours, it's always like they're sitting on the beach in the sun and the sunrise, and it's just like every day is an inspiration, and you just think, oh, crap, I can never be like Gabby Reese because I yeah. don't feel like that at all. I wake up with oatmeal st- stuck to my chin. You know, this is not how my, my life is. I'll share something with you. Like my, I had a knee replacement last year and my knee has probably been hurting me for upwards to 14 or 15 years prior to the surgery. Right. And even now to this day, it's not functioning really the way I would like it to. I mean, it's great. It was a great surgery and it's great. And there is frustration and insecurity and all kinds of emotions around this. And I deal with it every day. Um, but then the, So I guess what I'm saying is we all have these kind of self, whether they're um, self-inflicted obstacles or ones brought on by life that we are contending with. And it's kind of like how you look at it. So I can go, I could dive deep down that hole and be poor me and my knee's not bending and it's not straightening the way I want it to. And um, if steps are too high, I'm weird and feel awkward and all these things. Or I can say, but I'm not, I don't have a major illness. The rest of my body's working very well. And so I'm going to work around it. Um, and I'm going to acknowledge that some days I feel crappy and I feel uh, vulnerable and not my best self, um, but I'm going to work around it. And I and I really believe that that is life. You know, if you, you know, like, I guess maybe if it was like I was a Buddhist, that, that the pain and the good and the bad, it's all part of the same story. Yeah, I think it's important to realize that because a lot of times we're bombarded with this inspirational material that says you should feel good all the time, you should feel motivated all the time, you should feel, even though you have this setback, now it's your strength, and it's like, no, it's not a strength, it's a broken knee and it it sucks, but it's, I'm still able to persevere and push through that. Yeah, and I I think everybody has that because, you know, sometimes people say to me, wow, you know, I can't believe all that you, you, you know, you juggle and you get done. And I, and I say, okay, let's be really clear about something. First of all, um, I'm, I'm wildly incentivized, right? Like I, if I work, I, I probably get paid very well for what I do. Um, there's, there's rewards, there's attention, there's all these things, right? I say, you want to talk to me about somebody who's juggling a lot. How about somebody who, let's take a single parent, for example, who's working three jobs just to keep the lights on. Like that's the real stuff. And for me, I think it's about keeping perspective on, what we're reacting to. So, oh, you know, wha- you know, Laird calls it the wambulance. It's like, <laughs> oh my, you know, my knee is sore. It's like, yeah, big F and deal. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like it's keeping everything in its perspective and in its place because then emotionally you're sort of a, you're reacting to it kind of accordingly. Cause when I see what other people go through, I'm like, man, I have got nothing. I'm not doing, like, I'm not doing anything. I haven't done anything. Um, so I, I think it's for me, I'm, I kind of look at it that way. And, and, and I've said this many times, you know, we have low cards and high cards. It's like, which cards do you want to play in your hand? Do you want to cry that you have low cards? Or do you want to play your high cards and get on with it? By low cards and high cards, you just mean that everyone gets dealt hands and it just depends on which choices you're going to make that day, especially when it comes to the mood that you're in or how you react to events. Well, that's it. And, and, you know, it's like when I was younger, I had uh, my mom left for a few years. My dad died. I had some pretty wonky stuff happening, but yet I'm, I was six foot three at 15 and had a certain look that those were some high cards that if I navigated those correctly, they helped me, uh, overcome the low cards. And, and I think people, a lot of times are always retelling an old story. Um, I have to be mindful of that too. And going, well, this happened to me and that happened to me. It's like it did, but is there not something else in your story that, 
that could feasibly help you move on from that and even appreciate some of that stuff. And, and, and granted, listen, I'm not suggesting there aren't things that people go through that it's it's almost virtually impossible to get over. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying most of us walking around, it's like low cards and high cards, you know, pl- like there's all these beauty um, jingles, you know, accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, you know, it's all this stuff. It's kind of that silliness, but it's very true. Yeah. I think it's, it's, I'm not a huge fan of Instagram memes that make people feel inferior or, you know, attempts at being inspiring, but there is some truth to the fact that you can make choices with whatever you've got. And that a lot of times those same situations do make you stronger in one way, even if they are objectively not positive things. Well, again, I'll use my knee. I have tried more exercises and therapies and turmeric drinks than you can imagine. (laughs) And it's why, because I have an obstacle. If everything was cool, I'd just go on as usual. And because of this, this is a teacher that's making me stretch and learn more and understand about other things that I I probably wouldn't have because I'm inherently would be lazy and it wasn't necessary. So I, I agree with you. And, and I think my hope is like, I'm always want to talk about it in a very blue collar, matter of fact way. Like, I don't want to have my head in the clouds. I want to be, um, positive, but still in sort of in that, like, you know, very everyday way, because when people talk to me like that, that I can, I can connect with that when they go, Oh, you know, the spirit above and the sun is shining. I just go, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. So (laughs) it's like trying to find that real, um, matter of fact communication, but yes, being positive. Yeah. Where where did you learn a lot of the the matter of fact stuff? I mean, you grew up, where did you grow up? You grew up, um, Trinidad. No, my father's from Trinidad. So that's very good. Um, but close, I mean, I grew up in the, in the West Indies, but I did live in Long Island, New York for five years. Um, when I lived with friends of, of my mother, um, I was raised by my aunt and uncle Joe. And, and let me tell you, my uncle Joe was like a construction worker, worked for the sanitation department in New York. And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, my aunt and I used to say like, kid, you know, uh, go away, don't go away angry, but just go away. Like they're very direct New York, um, people. And then in the, in the Caribbean, when you grow up on an Island, it's, um, it is different than the mainland U S it's, um, I don't know. It's, it's kind of like, I see it when I live in Hawaii, there is a sort of a, a directness and a a shorthand and, and, um, and I'm glad, but I think I learned it definitely from, from those two places. And, and it was also something that maybe because that's the way I could hear things, maybe that that's the way I tried to communicate more. Sure. Sure. And, And sports and sports. Listen, let's call it for what it is. Starting at 15, I got really involved with sports. Coaches don't fluff it up and go on and on. They go, get it done, get to the line, get your arm up, get it together. You know, you can do it. Let's go. So I think that also, that shorthand got developed. Did you, I read that you didn't begin sports until 11th grade and you said age 15. So that kind of checks out. How come you didn't get into sports sooner? I mean, weren't you six foot something when you were like 12? Yeah, I was six feet at 12 and six, three at 15. But I, again, cause I grew up in the Caribbean. I dibbled, dabbled a little bit in volleyball, um, my 10th grade year. Um, but organized sports back then, uh, you know, on St. Thomas, it wasn't like, Oh, you know, you could do something with this. I think I was already dealing with some of my frustrations as a, as already that tumultuous time in my life, but also some of my history, was kind of aggravated. Um, so I started a little bit. And then when I moved to Florida, my junior year of high school, which things were more organized, athletics was sort of a real part of the, the culture and the school and things like that. And I walked in at 15 at six, three, they were like, Oh, you're playing volleyball and basketball. So that's kind of how it happened. You said you were aggravated when you were a kid, what was going on on the Island at that point? You know, I, I just had, I didn't have a lot of stability and I think I was truly hurt, um, from my situation with my mother. I was, I was hurt. My feelings were probably hurt and I probably hadn't gotten over it yet. You know, she, she did the best she could. And at, at, you know, two and a half years old, she needed to take a, she worked and left me with these people who raised me as their own child till I was seven and then the problem was is that then she decided she was ready. So then I got the extraction from that stable environment. And that was very difficult. And I think I, I carried that with me for 
for a while, but it was the best thing that ever happened because first of all, I, I, I understood, um, like fast forward in a weird way. My husband, I have a stepdaughter. She was a very small baby when I met my husband and I never thought for one second, like, Hey, I can be her mom because she has a great mom, but I knew I could be impactful because I had experienced it with my aunt. Like if I just love her, that can be powerful. Um, so I got that gift. I got um, being very resourceful, independent, organized, because a lot of the people around me were not. So there was a lot of great stuff that came out of it. But at that time, I was, and then I was pissed because we moved from my home in the Caribbean to Florida, which was really a very significant and important move that really changed the tra- trajectory of my whole life. But at the 15 years of, of age, you know, I'm leaving my boyfriend and my friends. Right, right. Yeah, and that's what's, that was of primary concern at that point, for sure. Yeah. Were there any special social skills that are required growing up on an island? And then how did those change when you got to the mainland U.S.? And you're like, not only do I have to move <laughs> and make new friends, I've got to figure out how people do things here again. Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'll take it a notch up from there. So I came from a really loosey-goosey West Indian culture. You know, I always say that if, A lot of the parents, if they weren't from there, why were they there? It's like all of our parents were in some level kind of lunatics. They were all, you know, it was carnival. Your parents would kind of disappear for two, three days. So, you know, you had that element to I'm when I moved to Florida, my mother put me in a very, very conservative Christian school. So not only was I switching cultures, then I was switching an entire kind of uh, way of living and what is what was, you know, I was never taught about what, how important it was, what people thought, you know, when you, that wasn't the thinking where I grew up. And then when you go to a very conservative Christian environment, the length of your skirt also is part of the conversation, right? So, I mean, it was radically different. And again, really, it it was important. I needed sort of another part of the scale. I needed to balance it out a little bit more. And I got that but the adjustment was brutal. I mean, the principal let me in the school and I had no formal religious kind of, uh, you know, training or a part of my life was, it just wasn't a part of uh, how I grew up. And then um, he, he actually ended up being a really important person, um, Mr. Greener, but he let me in the school. But the joke was I was the only quote unsaved person in the high school. (laughs) Wow. Try that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm six and I'm six, three. I have blonde hair. I probably swear like a sailor at a Christian school. So it was, um, <laughs> it was really funny, but then there I met very good people and I understood that people could live a sort of a, you know, there's all elements of religion for me, but then you go and certain people that have faith and, um, it makes them more loving and less judgmental and they they have great families and all the sort of the great parts of that. And I got to witness that and understand that, oh, that, you know, that's out there, too. Um, so it was great. And I had uh, incredible coaches that took time and invested in me as a person. And um, again, it really changed. I went from there to getting scholarships and going to college and playing ball and going on from there. And I, I think clearly if I hadn't gone there and had those people impact me, I I wouldn't, I would have never pulled it. You, you think you would have gone downhill just staying in that other environment? Yeah, I probably would have had a kid by 19, you oh, know, wow. if, you know, work in a gift shop because you don't understand what a big world it is sometimes when you live on an island and what is possible and how do you express yourself in those other ways? You don't, you're not really taught that. And I, I think it's important to have some of that, but then conversely, I think it's, dangerous to have kids be too stacked up and too scheduled and too performance oriented when they're young. So it's like just finding that middle ground saying it's like with my kids. I'm like, listen, be grounded. That's why I love living in Hawaii and come from that grounded place and that place of respect, you know, auntie and uncle culture. But you know what? You can be anything you want. It's a big world. So I think it for me that that I would have definitely probably stayed in St. Thomas and and just kind of lived that life. How do you pass these skills down to your kids besides just living in Hawaii? I mean, are you passing down athletic skills as well, work ethic? Because you work really hard. Yeah. I mean, my husband and I both are, by nature, I think we, you know, we're sort of grinders. But I, it's an interesting thing, man, when it's your own kids. They, I always say they don't 
They don't really listen to you. They really watch you. And you can't really tell them. You can try to instill the values um, and and tell them to what's important to you. So uh, honesty and hard work and and respecting others and respecting yourself. But then the communication is, now we want to encourage you to figure out what does turn you on and what excites you and what do you think you want to do. But you still have to hit those fundamentals. But I have no manual Ultimately, my kids probably listen to me, you know, 7% of the time. I'm not sure. <laughs> and and then, you know, you surround them with other people that can have these influences because we're limited, right? We're, we, we only know so much, but then maybe you've got these other people that they give them a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you hope that the impact, um, you know, helps them navigate their own life. And I tell my girls all the time, listen, I'm not here to control you. I'm trying to teach you to control yourself you know, and, and get you to do things that are good and right for you and for your whole life. But, um, there's, it is the hardest thing in the world to do. You mentioned in your book that becoming a mother is like flipping a switch and you become someone else. And it finally, parenting finally pushes you to grow up. What has it yeah. done to you? I mean, how have you grown up as a result of, of having kids? Well, it's a deconstruction, first of all. I was much smarter and knew a lot more about what was going on at 21. Now at 47, I'm like, holy, I don't know anything. And it brings you to your knees in a way that nothing else does. And you surrender. And at times, like, for example, you want to react how you feel. You really, it's important to react to what is right. And those things can be sometimes conflicted. So sometimes maybe I'm an impulse and I just want to tell everyone to F off and throw mm -hmm. shit and like freak out and, and, or whatever it is. Um, but in that moment, you've got to really be disciplined and go, what is the right thing to do right here and right now? And sometimes you can be honest with yourself and say, I have no clue. So I'm going to do the best I can. Um, but it really, it deconstructs you in a way that you know, nothing else I've ever done has not even sports. And, um, it makes you also have to really confront the fact that you're going to get it wrong a lot of the time. And that is a hard pill to swallow because you, it's so important and you're so passionate about doing it right. And there's just no chance. It just isn't. Do you still take your younger kids on the road with you for work? I know you used to do that. Yeah, I do. If it's, you know, especially if it's a little bit longer, like more than two or three days, um, and it's, it, it makes sense. Um, I'll take them, but Laird and I kind of have a thing where if one of us has to go, the other one's usually at home. And if it's something where he and I are going together, then we really try to make sure that they come with us. Because for me, I, I, that is my most important job and being away from them for a, a extended period of time doesn't feel natural. And and I will say this, we have the luxury to say, okay, we're going to take the girls. But, you know, there's days where I'm like, oh my God, I just should have left them, you know, because <laughs> they're, because it's, you know, kids don't do what you want them to do. So, you know, but that's the great thing. It's because it's, tr it's more honest. It's like, listen, you're not in control, really. I'm here in my life. I'm all scheduled up. It's all written down. It's all perfect. I'm not really in control. I like to pretend I'm in control. So the kids are, they remind you every single day, like, Zero control. Um, I, I laugh. I said this one time I was paddling on the river. I go, I realize I have power. Like I can say no to things. I can move them from one side to the next, but I have no control. And that is a really interesting thing. But yeah, we bring them because it's my family and, you know, they're going to move out. Our 21 year old is in college and, you know, they get on with their life. So this is the time. Yeah. You can't just, you can't pause their life while you're busy doing your thing. That's right. This is my time. Yeah, this is your time to mother them, and it, you can't choose how that's going to happen. Give it well, you can, I guess, but you chose to have it happen well alongside your career. So you can either just not be around, or you can say, "Hey, look, get in the van or or the plane yeah. or whatever." Yeah, and it's and listen, it's I call it the shit show, you know. And ask any woman that takes her kids, um, it's like you're putting on this hat and you're trying to be all together and do your career and your work, and then you know you're side jaw clenching, whispering to your kid like you know, be quiet, you know, or whatever it is. Like, it's just, but it's sort of beautiful because it's so chaotic and it's so honest and it keeps you from thinking like you're so together that, um, it, that part is, it's kind of, it's so human. Um, 
But yeah, because I personally, you know, Laird always jokes like he's like, you should have seen Gabby's car before she had kids. Like it was always clean and everything was organized. And, and you know, that goes out the window. Yeah. Now it's full of like wrappers for yeah. meal bars <laughs> and little toys. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, do you, it, did we have to have the socks from tennis in the car for like a week? I mean, can somebody not pick? I mean, and it's the same conversations over and over. Right. It's all that. So. Again, as much I I go in, you know, I call it the rack focus, right? It's in and out. You're always doing that in your life. Hopefully you're looking above yourself and watching yourself and going, whoa, how are you navigating that? And then sometimes you're in it and you're just freaking out. But it's, it's doing that rack focusing and, and trying to go, this is, this, is that that important? No, it's not that important. No, this is really important. And also laughing at yourself because sometimes you're just running around like a, almost like a lunatic and you go, look at you, you're, Kind of a lunatic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It must be hard to separate yourself <laughs> from that. It, it mentioned it. It sounds like you've got some skills from sports, business that are helping you with your family life. You mentioned <laughs> looking at different externally, looking at your situation. Yeah, I think that's. Listen, if I could, if I could say to people, sometimes the biggest gift is to back up and, or go up and look over um, because then it gives you that perspective. You know, uh, Neil and I were just talking about this. Like, it's not about us. You know, like sometimes like you're going through the day and especially women, right? We hitting, we're taking everything personal. And sometimes if you just back up a little and go, you know what? Yo, that's not about me. And, and even like my problems, like whatever problems I think I really have, if I just back up a little and, and go, is that really a problem? It's fine. You know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. So I'm very thankful for that trait. I think it has definitely probably helped my marriage a great deal <laughs> or staying married. Um, it's helped me keep my sense of humor and, um, and I, and hopefully it helps me save a lot of time on, you know, wasting energy and time on things that it ultimately it's like, who cares? How often do you do things for yourself that are not wife slash mother related? You know, my training has always been for me, you know, obviously it was part of my job, but now I look at my training as like the biggest gift and selfish thing I do for myself. And, and, um, and uh, again, not in a corny way, but it's like, yo, this is just for me, the person, not even the woman, like just this human that's like getting to express this part and, and doing something that I know no matter what, whether I do it for 10 minutes or 90 minutes, it's something really good for me. And, and so what used to be my job is also now become the, th the thing that when I get that done, I'm like, okay, I'm good. Well, I heard that when you were giving birth, Owen Wilson called and wanted some chili and wanted to hang out with Laird oh. and so. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It's better than that. So, <laughs> okay. so I was, uh, it was my third daughter and, and, uh, it was January 1st. Um, and so, you know, you think I'm like, nobody goes into labor on January 1st. It's probably not real, but whatever. So Laird went, we were still living on Maui at the time. And so Owen, this is the premise of it though. Luke, his brother, Luke, who's quite lovely, had been maybe a couple months prior, had done some activities with Laird. So I think in brotherly competition, he kind of bragged to Owen. So when Owen came to Maui, he spends a lot of time there. He calls the house and he's like, hey, Gabby, it's Owen Wilson. Is Laird there? And I was like, no, actually, he's in the, you know, at the beach at Hukipa, whatever. And he goes, well, I want to get into it. And what are you all doing later? And I was like, well, I think I'm actually having a baby. I'm in labor right now, but it was still mellow. You know, it hadn't kicked up yet. So lo I said, but you're welcome to go try and find him. Let's say it was like nine or 10 in the morning. Well, lo and behold, like at, you know, two o'clock or whatever, Laird and him drive up. He follows Laird to our house in Maui. Then Laird, he's like, are you good? And and what I did is, because I knew I was going to labor, I made a big giant pot of chili and gluten-free cornbread and all this stuff because I thought, okay, at least him and, and Reese, my middle, will have some food and they'll be good. And Laird's like, well, I'm going to show him, drive him out to the point and show him Piahi, which is uh, a wave known as Jaws. And uh, they come back and now I'm starting to ramp up. Now my contractions are getting closer together. The chili's cooked. They come in and I say to Laird, okay, you know, I think it's happening. And, uh, then, and Owen's like, I'm starving. And I go, well, I have chili here. And so then he's like asking me about sour cream. And my friend had flown in Jen to take care of my daughter and Laird when I was in having the baby. And she was a volleyball player and a strong girl. And she was getting, she's like, I'm going to punch him out. And I was like, take it easy. <laughs> 
And, you know, I'm literally in labor. Like, if you've ever seen a girl in labor, it's like, okay, one second. And then you sort of have your little mini shock. And then you're like, okay, what was that question? You know? And so, yeah, so Owen was there. Yeah. It was pretty funny. And he's like, mm -hmm. you're, you're between contractions. And he's like, where's the sour cream? Do you have sour cream? Where's the fridge? <laughs> if I could, if I was exaggerating, it wouldn't be as funny, but actually I'm, I'm dead serious. Um, that's probably why he's good at his job. You know? Why? What do you mean? Cause I'm like, these actors, man, they are, it's, they're clueless. Like it's, <laughs> and I'm joking, but it's like, they sort of live in their mind and in their world. And I have a few friends that do that craft and they're not quite like that, but part of them, that's what's sort of magical about them. But you're like, how is it over there? You know, as I'm like bent over in the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, it was pretty funny. It was actually, uh, it, I mean, it, listen, at least on the way to the hospital, I'm like, wow, okay. Yeah. No, I mean, you're obviously really tough, especially when it comes to that sort of thing. You're the first female athlete to have her own shoe, which I tried mm -hmm. to look at online. But when I when I Googled Gabrielle Reich Nike shoe, all I found was like 8000 pictures of you in a sports bra or playing volleyball or something like that. Oh. <laughs> I was really fortunate, you know, that I always say that's like timing, you know, and uh, and the other side of that that was really cool was they Tinker Hatfield was the designer of my shoe. And so for anyone who's a sort of sneakerhead, if you will. Tinker was really the responsible person for the Air Jordans and that brand for a really long time. And he's just a very talented guy. So, you know, the su success of that shoe was really also the fact that Tinker designed the shoe, um, obviously. So we did a few seasons and the shoe did very, very well. And um, I was signed for, for cross training, for training. That was like when Bo knows that whole thing was going on. Oh, yeah. And so it was kind of better for me because volleyball is so small, but to cross over and really be signed for training, um, that gave me a little bit more room and extension inside of Nike that I wouldn't have had if I was signed only for volleyball. How do you deal with that? That whole business seems like it's just loaded with ego and testosterone. Even in your personal life, you got athlete friends. Are you, yeah. how do you turn it off or do you, or do you just deal with it? And that's a fact of life with those people. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'll be honest with you. Um, at this time in our lives, and, and I'll use Laird as sort of a partner in this, you know, generally we don't spend a lot of time with people that they are alphas, but um, they have, it's like they've got weird balance or at least they balance it when they're around us. Cause you know, my husband is pretty alphish and we always say everybody leaves it at the door because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is get together, enjoy each other, maybe learn from each other, push each other. Um, those other types, they kind of don't survive in our environment uh, because both of us, we can, we have different gears, you know, if you will. Um, but cause you start to realize like, Hey, the essence of life is um, you don't actually want to be the best or the smartest or the strongest in the room. You want to be around those kind of people because then they're going to make you better. Um, but if you want to compete, okay, well, we can do that too, mm -hmm. but that's not as productive. Um, but you know, it's, it's sometimes it's almost a sign of youth when you see a lot of that, you go, oh, they haven't, they haven't dialed it in yet. And they're still a little afraid and they're unsure of their place. And so you, you kind of understand it also a little bit. I think that makes sense. Yeah. It seems like you got to know when to bring in the competition, when it's making you better and when it's actually not. That's right, because the competition, when you're competing against somebody who can actually help you, you're losing an opportunity to learn from them and connect and tap into their power. Be so I think it's also it's a yielding that has to occur where each person can acknowledge and go, hey, you know what? I, I did what you do or I respect you. And then you can really get some stuff done versus I'm so great. I'm a badass and you want to compete because then all of a sudden now you're going to rub against them versus learn from them and hook in with them. I think it's interesting that you take that stuff into your marriage as well. I know I know you're big on spending time with happily married good communicators and you credit that with the in part with the success of your marriage as well. It sounds a lot like that Jim Rohn quote like you only go as high as your five closest friends or the people you spend time around or who you become and things like that. How does that apply in your relationships? How are you how did you set that up and how does it help you? Uh, like, I'll just use Laird and I as an example. People sure. go, gosh, you guys seem to really like each other so much. And I said, you know, th the thing I know about each of us individually is why bother? Like, I'm not going to do it and be in this relationship and be with him if, one, I'm not coming at it with the attitude of how can I make his life better? How can I help him out? And also, I want to enjoy it. I want to respect him. And 
And otherwise, I'd rather be alone. I'd rather not be married. And and I know he's even more intense about it than I am, is sort of saying, if we're going to do this, whatever this is, so everybody has a, many this is in their, in their life, right? It's work, it's relationships, it's self-care, whatever. Why not make it great if you can? If you can, sometimes you can't. Like if I, if Laird and I got to a point where I was like, this just probably isn't working mm-hmm. and we've tried a lot of stuff. Okay. There's, that's a different thing, but like, wow, if I can participate in this and try to make this great, why would I not do that? If I, if I walk up to a counter, um, and at the ticket counter or something, and I'm going to interact with the person, why would I not come out with, at it with like, Hey, good afternoon. How are you today? Okay. I need some help. Like why? So I think for me, it's, it's, it's like, you're always trying to operate in that place because then all of a sudden your world you're living on that frequency versus everywhere you go you've got conflict um you can't stand your partner you can't stand yourself your life it sucks it's like okay i get it so what can you do to sort of say what how can i try to make it great and it's an amazing thing when people are personally accountable and say well i'll do my part and then see what happens your career is i think a lot larger than his, if you're going to compare the two. And I don't, I'm doing that only because I know that you mentioned in your book that you kept making your personality a little bit smaller in order to kind of manage your relationship. What was that like? And what did that do for your relationship or to your relationship? You know, I was young. I was 25 when I met Laird, but because of the nature of my job, I, I got to kind of jump on things a little bit. And, um, I think it's really typical of females. And I will say this, and I've talked about this a little bit. I was not groomed for success the way I grew up. And so I don't know if you can relate to this, but as things start to open up for you and things start to happen, you it feels uncomfortable and you feel weird and guilty and you feel all this stuff that you got to figure out how to manage success, right? So then I get partnered with somebody who I knew intuitively, Laird is better at what he does than at what I do. Do I do a lot more, I do a variety of things pretty well, maybe more than him, but what, at what he does, he's so much better like at surfing than I ever was at volleyball. Right. So I was dealing with that and I was the female and there was all this. So there was this kind of natural thing where I was like, well, I don't want to make him feel bad. And so I'll be less than, um, and, and really what it came down to is once Laird sort of had his own footing and a couple of pats on the back, if you will, it really, and also maturity, you know, he grew up too. And I think once men become a little more developed, there's room like, Oh yeah, honey, go ahead. Kick some ass. Awesome. Bravo. But when you're younger, maybe it f- makes you feel threatened. So we were dealing with all these dynamics when we first got together and then we worked through it. You know, we almost got divorced and then it was like, I, you know, we really love each other. Let's try to work this out. And then I think it's like we both kind of grew up a little bit and, and, and it took time. I, I mean, part of me, you know, I, I know it sounds silly. I kicked myself in the ass because I spent a lot of time apologizing for everything in my twenties to everybody, teammates and, you know, everything, mm-hmm. because I, I, I felt bad for getting a lot of opportunities and getting singled out. And I wish I hadn't done that. Like, I wish I had just been like, you know, what? I'm gonna put my foot on the gas and I'm going to be as badass as I can be. And everyone can suck it if they don't like it. But I didn't, you don't, you know, you're not doing, a lot of us are not doing that, especially women in their 20s. Some are. It's true. And I think a lot of people feel like they can't do that as well. And I know that you also, even more recently, you've talked about how women being submissive in relationships is actually a sign of strength and not weakness, depending on how it's done. Mm -hmm. And uh, one interesting quote that I pulled was, we don't worry about men having it all. So I don't know where we got this idea that to have it all. And mm-hmm. you talk a lot about how women need to take care of themselves and their their man. Have you taken flack for that from the sort of ultra <laughs> feminist camp? I, you, I would imagine. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I mean, I got like, oh, you set back the feminist movement for twenty years. So th- there's a couple layers into that. First of all, I call it the po- a post feminist conversation because let's say if I was born just a little earlier. Remember, I was born right at title at, at title nine. So I am the first generation, exactly seventeen or eighteen years after it's passed to get a full ride scholarship to go to college. So there's things I didn't have to navigate that the women before me did. So I understand from their point of view, like what a sucky comment that is. And plus the fact that the word submissive makes a lot of people nervous, but the way I used it was in service. And 
I, I genuinely believe that, and I was only speaking from my personal experience, that the idea of serving your partner um, and serving your, your children and your family uh, is a lot of work and takes, and is a sign of great strength. However, I am not an idiot or say like throw yourself in front of the bus and do it because it's Archie Bunker's your husband. It's like, yo, pick a good partner who's on the same page as you. But for me to try to communicate what Laird should do is stupid. Laird's got to do what he should do. Not me tell Laird, you know, well, if you do this, then I'll do that. How about this? I'm going to choose to be the best partner I can be. I'm going to work my ass off. I'm going to be, try to be great for you. And hopefully you'll do the same thing. And by the way, if he didn't, um, we probably wouldn't be together for almost 22 years. So I think it's, we're also in a time where people are very combative and it's all like, well, no, you're not going to get up on me. And if you want this, then, or I'll give you this, if you do that, that doesn't work. And by the way, if you're with an alpha male, that will blow up in your face in about seven minutes. Hmm. You, You don't tell an alpha male, do this. What you do is you hold your line, you live the way you want to live. And what I have seen is you can inspire someone. They can look at you and go, wow, she's really like on her game. I be- I'm going to get on my game. Not you better. That doesn't work. And so people, I think they misunderstood and oversimplified what I was saying. Um, and I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, Katie Couric was like, you know, in my house, everything was equal. And I was like, really, there's no such thing as equal in a house. And then you, you add some kids and it's definitely not equal. And, and even if it means that the, the woman is the alpha, there's no two male energies, even in a, in a straighter gay couple, there's one masculine energy and one feminine. And I was saying in my house, I took the role of feminine because Lord, Lord definitely takes the role of masculine And just finding that, having that conversation of flow, because then I walk out the door and then I'm back to alpha. So how does that work? And also once or twice a year, Laird knows that's it. Like, here's a line. You want to cross the line. Let's go. I'm down. So (laughs) it's not about being a doormat, but it's also talking about there's, I think, great strength in yielding. I always use the analogy, the grocery store. You're coming down the aisle. I'm coming down the aisle the other way. If I see you, guess what? Even if you're younger, or whatever, it's like, I'll move to the side to let you go. It'll take me three seconds. And it, it's a nice gesture. Uh, could I go through you, over you? I could. But why? And so I guess I think, you know, we read, Larry read this book and it, it talks about, it's called uh, Natural Born Heroes. And it says, hey, listen, to be a true warrior, you have to be compassionate. So we're in a culture right now where everyone's forgetting about service and kindness and all these things that really are powerful. Yeah, I think there's something to that. And and it seems like coming from a place of power is more effective in the end than coming at it from a place of, well, the, the opposite or some sort of mishmash of the two. And especially when you're dealing with somebody like Laird, I know you mentioned in the book, you call him the weatherman because he's super (laughs) moody (laughs) and you can't take responsibility for someone else's happiness like that. And I know earlier in your marriage, one of the things that was causing the problems was you had this mindset that, well, if he really loved me, he'd be happy with me. Most of the time I'm responsible for making him happy. And you just can't do that to yourself. Well, you can't, you can't do that. It's, it's, um, it's a kind of a ridiculous notion to think that you, you can make someone else happy and that someone else can make you happy. You can improve someone else's life. You can inspire people. You can have that back at you, but we all sort of have to work out our own stuff, if you will. Um, and what's been interesting is to watch Laird over the years, like his moods are, and I don't know if it's the tenderizing of our children, but you know, he's really leveled out and it's a a very, I think it's an interesting thing to watch men grow up because then all of a sudden it's like young guys come, they train. He's like, yeah, go ahead. You go, you know, it's like an an interesting thing where I think you learn to back up. And I believe this as an adult, it's like my kids tell me stuff that of course I know. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting, but I don't need to, for them to know I'm right. Or that I knew that already. It's like, I don't care. You know, it's, uh, there comes a point where you you sort of surrender to to everyone needing to know how smart and on it you are. It's like, I don't really give a shit. It's like, I, I got to, you know, I'm busy. I got stuff to do. And whether you get it or not, or, you know, and, and I, and a big thing as a woman was not taking it personal and, and, and understanding that 
that intensity in Laird was also attached to about 50 other things that I loved about him. And so cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, great. I mean, it's, I'm glad that it's worked out so well so far. I'm glad that we met recently and became friends because I think you're an awesome person. I'm glad you took your time here to be on the show with us. I really appreciate it. Well, I, I really appreciate the work that you do and, and, uh, I'm happy, you know, for you and and for the message that you're putting out with the show. So thank you so much for having me. Obviously, it's there's a lot of stuff going on in the world at the moment. And I actually think that um, I always say to Laird, you know, we really have to fortify ourselves more. And, And what I mean by that is, you know, just to encourage people to try to keep taking care of themselves and and also to be. I know it's so corny, like, oh, be positive. But I think the world needs sort of some kind of like po- love positivity um and 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 also remind them that like it's short so if you got something you want to do and you haven't taken that risk if you can do it in a calculated and smart way without ruining your life you got to go for it great message thank you very much aloha